expect big things. Yeah, good thing, Ernie. Um, well, welcome. Good evening. Here from uh, sunny Northern Ireland. <laughs> what a, today ended up pretty nice. Um, not that it matters, but you know, it, it always helps. It helps when there's a sunny day and to get us through the dull and gloomy days that are much more common here. Um, so I want to welcome you all to Calvary Brave Valley's midweek Bible study. Tonight we are going to be in Psalm number 30, 3 0. For our um, Irish friends in the South, it's Psalm 30. That just, for some reason, that just doesn't sound right. I can't, I can't speak Irish, so I'll stick with my American accent if you don't mind. <laughs> so I want to welcome you all. You. Um, <laughs> so let's go ahead. We'd better go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this evening. <laughs> So, Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is just powerful. It's alive. It's living. It's a, it's a living document. It's a love letter from yourself, God, to each one of us. And in this letters, you, you, you teach us um, wisdom. You give us understanding. And you show us yourself. So, Lord, I pray that you would do that tonight through this Psalm 30, that you would, you would bless this, this word and that you would speak to each and every person that listens. Lord, as I prayed earlier, I pray again, I don't want to speak to anybody tonight. I want the Holy Spirit, you, Lord, to speak to the people through your word. So, Lord, I pray that you inspire me and lead me along by your word that you can minister to and you can speak to each one of us through this um, powerful song. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome. This is Psalm 30, our midweek Bible study. I've called this, sort of titled this psalm, Praise to the God who is involved in our lives. It's a very personal psalm. It's a psalm of David. It says right in the title, in the beginning. And it's a psalm that, as Ernie has, has taught us in, in the, the weeks past, psalms are a variety of things. Many of them are songs, I mean, I think for the Hebrew people, they were all made into songs and were sung. But um, some are um, specifically songs, and this is one of them. This this says in the title that this is a psalm, a song by David. And it's written for the dedication of the temple. The actual word used is not temple, but uh, for the dedication of the house. The temple, the word they used for temple was house. The temple was the building that housed, well, the main purpose of the temple was to house the uh, Ark of the Covenant with its cover, the mercy seat, covered by the cherubims with their, angel, with their wings over this mercy seat, over this cover of the Ark. And that was where the very presence of God um, lived. This was a house built for the presence of God. This was the temple of the living God. Now we know as Christians in this New Testament era, uh, the temple of God is not a building anymore. It's us. The temple of the Holy Spirit is now you and me, fellow believer. And if you're not a believer in Christ, the presence of the Lord in the, your spirit is not there. Oh, that you would choose to house the presence of God. And we do so by 
opening our hearts up and receiving Christ into our heart and receiving forgiveness for our sins, which he paid for on the cross at Calvary, in which he won the victory by the resurrection, by rising from the dead on the third day following. So praise the Lord. So those of us who are Christians, we house the Holy Spirit. We house the presence of the Lord. Now the history of this is very interesting though, behind this psalm. This psalm was written as a dedication to the temple by King David. He never got to see this performed or sung as praise to God at the temple because he was not allowed by God to build the temple. He wanted to so very much, uh, but God came to him through a prophet and said, No, David, you're a man of, 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 of war. You've killed many people. Uh, your hands are kind of bloody. I led you this way, but I'm not going to have you build my house, build the temple. I will have your son, the one that I choose, build the temple. And so David got excited, though, and he set apart preparing um, all the plans, uh, 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 collecting and gathering all the materials. I mean, just in pure gold itself, in the temple building, was 23 tons of pure gold that lined the walls, the ceiling, even the floors of the temple. And David had such success as a man of war, gathering all this booty and loot. So he gathered together uh, the gold and the silver and the bronze that would be needed. He made plans, architectural drawings of the building. He um, set apart what the uh, carvings and uh, inside would look like and had these plans drawn up and made for Solomon. And he set up how the worship would be. He set up the, the specific uh, leaders of worship, even where they would be on the day that the temple was dedicated, that he wouldn't be there to see. So though he actually did not build or construct the temple, he saw it in his mind and um, directed him. Like I said, it was actually his son Solomon who built the temple. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, it says, starting in verse 10, David speaking, and speaking to his son Solomon, he said, Be careful now, for the Lord... Yahweh has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then it goes on to say, Then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple and of its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms and its inner chambers, and of the room for the mercy seat, the holy of holies, and the plan of all the house of God. Um, I'm sorry, and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers, the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for the dedicated gifts for the division of the priests and of the Levites, and all the work of the service in the house of the Lord, for all the vessels for the service in the house of the Lord. So we made all these plans, detailed plans, and gathered all the all the things necessary, uh, directed uh, Solomon where he would get all the wood and the stone for its creation. Uh, now, it does not say when this psalm was written, this psalm of dedication. It must have been late in David's life. Uh, but I believe there are hints, pretty broad hints, which I'll sort of point out in this psalm as to when it was written. And I think it was written after the uh, revolt by his son Absalom. That occurred late in his reign when his 
then eldest son Absalom uh, had a coup d'etat, had a coup and toppled his own father as leader of Israel. He uh, wooed all the hearts of the people of Israel to himself and then struck when the time was right. And David had to flee the throne. He had to flee Jerusalem and, um, and, and left there. And he was a hunted man again. His own son, Absalom, wanted his life, wanted to take his life, and he had to flee away for safety. And by God's uh, provision and, and methods, he was able to um, eventually return because uh, the, the forces of, of Absalom waged war with David's forces and were soundly beaten, and Joab killed um, the head of David's army killed Absalom himself, even though David had ordered everyone not to. Uh, Joab was a, a, a brutal, but a wise <laughs> man, and, and did that. So then David returned to Jerusalem, returned to his throne in triumph, but humbled. And so I think we'll see a lot of that, his heart, in this. Because this psalm, as has been described in a, a study Bible, this is a psalm of personal thanksgiving for God's repeated care and deliverance over the course of a life. So I'll read through the whole psalm, and then we'll go back and look at selected verses and sections. So, uh, Psalm 30. A psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. But, I added that, but you hid your face. I was dismayed. So to you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit, or if I go down to corruption? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear me, O Lord, and be merciful to me, O Lord, my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing, and you have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent, O Lord, my God. I will give thanks to you forever. Praise the Lord. Well, were you kind of thinking, as I was thinking, this is kind of an odd song, odd song for the dedication of the temple. It's a very personal song of da a psalm of David, isn't it? He is really, he's just, David was so transparent. You know, I, I love it so much. He just opened up his life, opened up himself to the people and said, here I am. This is what I'm like. This is what I've done. This is what the Lord had to do to me. This is how I felt. This is what God did. Uh, we can all relate to this. You know, it's a good psalm to read during this time of, of crisis, during the time of the, um, you know, lockdown that we're in throughout the world. Um, but this was written for the dedication of the temple. Do we have that book? I might as well show it now. I thought, is that what you got it for? You? No. 
Do you get it for the morning? In our Bible reading, it's really something. Today, we read uh, of Solomon's uh, uh, beginning uh, Solomon's work and all the things that it took for the temple. This is a how's it look? This is a uh, a, a drawing of Solomon's temple, and it's very very glorious, and massive, and huge. I think, yeah, you can kind of see figures there and all that. Three stories tall. This is a cutaway view of the of the inside. Don't know if that's as easy a view to see, but it was a very impressive building, a very great building to, you know, what building could house the awesome, glorious presence of the Lord and power of the Lord. This was the building that, that God inspired David to design and Solomon to build. So David thinking of, of, of the Lord and of this, you know, this was the building, this was the temple to house the Lord. And so he just sort of begins thinking of the Lord and bursts out in praise. Um, that first verse says, I will extol you, O Lord. What in the world does that mean? Some, if you have a different translation, this is the ESV version, the translation. Some of you might have different words for this. But that he, the, the word in Hebrew for translated here to extol is literally to rise, to exalt. Some of your translations, if you have a different one, may have that word. I will exalt you, O Lord. Uh, it's, it's the term of, of, of raising up, of building up. You know, think of, uh, 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 it's the word to, to rise, to raise. Think of building a skyscraper. Think of building the temple. That may have been what he had in mind. You know, as you build the foundation, as you build the first stones, as you build the second layer and on up, you know, it's rising up. And he's thinking, boy, just as the temple will rise up, my praise to you will rise up. I will lift up to you praise, O God. Yeah, thinking of you, Ernie. Ernie right now is working on a project. We can't wait for him to finish. It's a, a pizza stove made with brick and block. And he's been extolling. He's been rising up the, this brick from a slab built on the ground and built up there. And I think through it all, it's going pretty well. So he is exalting the Lord. He is lifting up and praising the name of the Lord through this and trusting the Lord for success in his, in his work, so is David. I will, I will raise up, I will lift up praise to you, Lord. And then he says, for you have, ESV uses again an, an odd word, you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. Um, that word, to, to be drawn up, it means... Um, what well, literally means to draw up, like uh, dipping a bucket down in a well, and then you draw it up, you pull it up out of a pit, you pull it up out for use, or to dangle. You know, I think of Jeremiah the prophet of this. He was drawn up out of a, a, a cesspool. You know, when things got really bad, he was arrested for preaching the word of God. People didn't like what he said and they arrested him and threw him in a dungeon and this dungeon was just a thick layer of muck and guck and you know mud and he sunk into it and he was afraid he was going to drown and he called out for help and one good man came and drew him out of that pit of that cistern. And that's the very thing that's here. It says, God, you have drawn me up. You have lifted me out of trouble. You have lifted me out from danger. And you have not let my foes, my enemies, rejoice over me. 
and that's a, a, a saying of like, a, a, um, the NIV uses a great word. They says, um, don't let my, you have not let my foes gloat over me. You know, sort of like, ha, 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 I'll rejoice. We got you now, David. We won, you know. We rule, you drool. Um, and worse, you know, that's, the, that's the, the rejoicing, the type of over him. And so you sort of see lifting, raising up going on in this. Let me re restate this verse in Rex version. Um, let me say this. I thought I... <laughs> okay. Uh, it's this. Yahweh, I lift you up in praise because you have lifted me up and have not let my foes be lifted up over me. See, a whole lot of raising going on. So, in these first three verses, um, he is praising the Lord. And he's praising the Lord for three things. This first verse, he was praising the Lord for God's deliverance and justice for him. The second verse, it reads, uh, if I can read it literally so you get the power and sense of the word. It says, O Yahweh, my Elohe. Yahweh is uh, uh, the word, the highest word for the Lord. You know, when it's translated in our Bibles, very often, Lord is we translating Yahweh. It's spelled all in capitals. And, you know, that's this is the Lord who has revealed himself to Moses as I am. I am that I am, or the one who is. And the second word, Elohe, or from Elohim, means a Lord and Master. So, O oh Yahweh, my Lord and Master, I cried to you and you healed me. And to cry here is interesting. It's literally to shout out for help, to cry out, to scream, to not be shy, to be desperate um, because of the danger it's in. A healing, physical danger was there. And and it says, a healing I cried out, and you healed me. And to heal here means to heal. That's It's just exactly literally what the word says. So the second thing that David is praising the Lord for is he is the God that has healed. And he changes not in the same. And the third verse, again, it says... Um, Lifting up is going on again. It says, O Lord, you have brought up or pulled up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sheol, it was the place of the dead. It's, uh, it's a picturesque word of where the soul goes when it when it dies and is waiting for the resurrection. Um, it's the place of the dead. And when it says that you restored me to life, that word restore is literally rescued. In effect, he's saying, you spared my life. And from what? It says, you spared my life from being among those who die, who go down to the pit. Uh, this word pit is an interesting word. It is literally a well or a cistern or a pit, something that's dug out. It's not used often for, as David is using it here. Um, a little bit later, we see a pit again. It's a different word for pit. That, liter that means more exactly this. But he's just saying, so it gives a picture. Hebrew is a very picturesque word. It uses a lot of word pictures. And, and it, it's good to, to study this. So you, you just sort of get a picture here. It says, you have, you have 
pulled up. It's like, like, you know, like Jeremiah was. Uh, he had, you know, ropes tied around his, under his arms by God, and, and you know, he was on his way to death to the, to the pit, and God well, rescued him. He spared my life. He didn't let him go. So, um, David is praising the Lord because he has saved his soul. So the three things in these first three verses that David opens this psalm with is praise to the Lord for deliverance, for healing, and for salvation. Now when David thought of the temple and who it is whose presence is in the temple, this is what he burst out in praise for and thinking about. The God who delivers the God who heals, and the God who saves. Praise the Lord. So in the fourth verse, it says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. You know, See, I told you this was a song. And this is, in this psalm, the only time that worshipers who would be at the temple are mentioned. You know, that's us, you his saints, his holy ones. You, too, give thanks to his holy name. Then it goes on, sort of a whoop, an, a, an abrupt change. In verse 5, it says, For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So, it says that God's anger with us, and like I've said before, God does not is not angry at us personally as a person. He, is, he gets angry at sin. So basically, when we sin, and we're all but sinners, saved by grace, uh, when we sin, he's angry at the sin. But it says in the beautiful thing, this anger is fleeting. It passes quickly from God. As the ESV put it, it's but for a moment. In, 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 in light of, of life and the whole thing, it's just a short time. And it says that, you know, this anger is fleeting and passes quickly. But his favor, his pleasure in us, his delight in us, his acceptance of us lasts all life. It lasts a lifetime. So a great contrast between God's anger and God's love and acceptance. Well, not love because it's all love. His pleasure, his delight, his acceptance in us, which lasts all life. So it goes on and said, weeping, sadness over whatever ever might be. We're all, we've all gotten those places where, uh, you know, we're sad about something, we're grieving about something, we're mourning a loss, um, we're disappointed, you know, we're sad, we're set back, you know. You know, and it said that, that this weeping, this sadness may tarry. And that word tarry is, to, is, is literally to spend the night. It's to lodge, it's to find lodgings, have a roof over your head to pass the night. It says, but morning comes quickly. Night doesn't last that long. And the morning quickly, before you know it, comes. And it comes with rejoicing. A ringing cry of rejoicing. Oh, there may have been weeping, there may have been sadness for a little while. And it's horrible. It seems like when you're in it, it seems like that would last forever. It's never going to change, but it does. Things always change. And the times, the things that make you weep and make you sad will just pass a night time. And then morning, dawn will come. Things will change. God will bring the breakthrough. And you cry out with a cry, a shout of joy. In the morning. So weeping may pass the night, but morning comes 
with shouts of joy. <laughs> and the next verse, and again, this is a verse that makes me think that David wrote this thinking about what happened with Absalom. Because think of it, if Absalom's rebellion had succeeded, things would have really changed. Oh, a son of David would have been on the throne of, 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 of Israel, but not God's choice. And the one whom God had already chosen, had already planned and purposed to be the one to build the temple, would not have been there. He probably, Solomon probably would have been killed off by Absalom if Absalom's rebellion had won. It would have been a disaster for the world as well as a personal disaster for David. And if that had succeeded, the temple might not have been built. This guy, Absalom, was all he cared about was himself. He didn't care about the things of God or the things of the nation or the people. So, um, you know, David saying, hey, you know, before this happened, when I was, as it says, um, uh, Well, verse 7 said, he made my mountain strong. When I was, when, when things were good, he, he didn't have a worry. He wasn't as concerned. He really wasn't thinking about God. And it's not true for all of us. When things are going good, God gets a little bit distant. The moment things turn bad, whoa, we go running to the Lord. Help, Lord, you know, help us, get, let me out of here. So, you know, this is so true. And this is true of all of us. He said in my prosperity, when things were going good, when he, and he said, you know, he said, I'm solid. You know, I'll never be shaken. Um, um, it, you know, he was said, when he said, I shall never be moved. Uh, I'll not be shaken. That's good. I always wonder where that song, you know, I shall not be moved, came from. And I think it came from this verse. <laughs> but another another word that this word moved or shaken can be is overthrown. Whoa. Think of it that way. Uh, think of it that way. He said, in my prosperities, when... Um, well, let me read it instead. I said, in my prosperity... I'll never be overthrown. He probably actually thought that. So what a shock when he was overthrown and had to flee for his life from Absalom. Um, another version of the Bible puts it this way, puts this verse this way. It's the NET, the New English translation says, In my self-confidence, I said, I will never be upended. And that's true when we are self-confident, when we think by our own hands we're, we're going well. We think, oh, things will go on as they are. We'll never be upset. Um, all my projects and plans will come about. Oh, watch out. <laughs> watch out. Um, and this is what self-confidence can bring. Because um, David said, he continues to say, in your favor... Your favor was on me, and it made my life strong and solid. But then, things collapsed. <laughs> the, 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 the bottom fell out. The ground fell out from underneath him. You know, just suddenly, without warning, he had no clue of what Absalom had been cooking up. Uh, and so... You know, thinking he could never be shaken, never be overthrown, to um, you know, all of a sudden it says, "You hid your face," and I was dismayed. When I was good, when I was strong, when I was so confident, when I was comfortable, when things were going good, sure I knew you were there, but then all of a sudden, you hid your face. You know what happens to all of us? We 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 go through times when we sense the presence of the Lord, when we can just sort of feel that He's there, when it's easy to
to trust in Him when it's easy to have faith. But then things get shaken. Fiery darts get thrown at us. And it's as if all of a sudden the God who was there is not there anymore. We've all said it. We've all felt it. We all go through this. I think goodness for David. He's being so honest, so transparent, like I said. And we can all relate to this mighty man of God, this king of Israel. Uh, because we've all been there. Feel like he's hiding. He's, he's, he's uh, hit his face. What's the result? It says, I was dismayed. Um, that word dismayed means um, uh, disturbed, dismayed, terrified. A lot of versions use that word for this. You hid your face and I was terrified. The word itself also means hasty. You know, when we, we, we are, God's not there, we get in a panic. We can do things hastily without thinking them through, without thinking of what the consequences will be. And then it just goes from bad to worse, doesn't it? Oh, so, you know, when God hides his face, is not the time to move, is the time to seek in. And like Jesus said, keep on asking and it'll be given to you. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened. Keep on seeking and you will find. So, verse 8, it says, To you, O Lord, this is Yahweh, I cried, and to the Lord, Yahweh, I plead for mercy. This, I, 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 again, another version of the Bible puts it this way. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, Lord, I called to you. I sought favor from my Lord. Um, that word mercy is the same type of word as grace. God's favor. I sought your grace. I sought your favor. I sought, begged for mercy. He is desperate here. He goes on and says, what profit is there if I die? If I go down to the pit or if I go into corruption? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Which is just a poetic view of saying when you're gone, you're gone. You're not here to praise the Lord anymore on this earth, though you're never gone, if you know what I mean. Um, you, you are gone from the earth and you don't have vocal cords that can praise the Lord or seek his help. Is what he's saying here. So what good is that if I'm gone? What good is my death will do? So he goes on and says, Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Again, this is an interesting song of dedication for the temple, isn't it? Well, what was the temple? The temple was the place where the presence of the Lord was glorified. So it's like the place you go to for the person in the Lord that you want and need. So, it's sort of the purpose of the temple and its place. Hear again, verse 10 through 12. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. For you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Praise the Lord. Ah, forever. So he's, st he's still pleading at the start of this. He says, Please listen, Lord. You know, hear me. Listen. Pay attention to what I'm saying. You know, be merciful. Be gracious to me now. It's like... You know, I, you're, you've hid your presence from me. I, I, I'm not here. I've come to your temple. I've come to the place you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be here. Please listen. Please show up. Please help me. And he does. Boom. The next verse, 11, says, You have. Woo Praise the Lord. I lift you up. I extol you. I exalt you in praise and glory because 
you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. It's breakthrough again. And it always comes. God's faithful. The times of, of, of doubt, the times of distance, the times of, uh, uh, of those feelings not there will pass. God will break through uh, that he will be there. And uh, it's interesting that word for mourning literally is wailing. The Hebrews, when they mourned the death of someone, they didn't hold back. They wailed and moaned and cried and shrieked and, you know, they didn't hold back. And that's what it's saying. You turned uh, this, this morning, my wailing of sadness and sorrow, into dancing. I can't, it's such great word pictures, isn't it? Going around, oh, Lord, this is so horrible. And you turn it into, woohoo, let's dance. We're going to party and move around. You know, that's how God is. He moves our hearts. Our hearts are, 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 aren't, you know, rocks. They're living things. And we go from oh, horrible sadness. World's going to end. Um, it's over with. I'm done for to, whoa, this is great. Isn't life wonderful? Oh, I'm living the best day possible. This is great. That's what God does because he changes our heart. This changes from the inside. Our own feelings bring that mourning and wailing of sadness. God working inside our heart lifts us out, frees us, releases us. Uh, it says, you've loosed my sackcloth. Sackcloth was was itchy, horrible, um, like burlap. yeah, like burlap or like horse hair. You know, think of, of wool on steroids. You know, how scratchy wool is. You know, this is sackcloth. You know, I'm going to put on my sackcloth. I'm going to put on this miserable things. I'm going to clothe myself with self-pity and misery and hardship and horribleness. Well, it says, you... God, you took this off. You took off my sackcloth, my, my mourning clothes, my grieving clothes. And it doesn't say he just looped off other versions of the word. It says you peeled it off. You unclasped it. You loosened it. You, you loosened it. You yourself undid it, took it off and threw it away. And you put on me, you clothed me with joy. Going from horrible, self-pity, yucky, loathing to, whoa, release, dance clothes. You took off my morning clothes and put on my comfortable, stretchy leotards so I could dance with joy and jump around and praise you with my heart's desire. And it ends on this high, high note that my glory, that just simply means my heart, my, my glory, my intention, my inside, all of me inside, my intent, what I want to do, all of me wants to sing your praise and not be silent. No one can shut me up. I don't care what people think of me. I'm going to praise your name. I'm going to dance around and be foolish for Jesus. I'm going to Give you glory, Lord, and give you praise with all of my heart because it's coming from my heart, from the inside. You have set me free. You have loosed me. I lift you up because you have lifted me up. And I will give you thanks forever. That's one thing we'll be doing in eternity is giving thanks and praise Raising up, exalting, lifting up, praising the name of the Lord in his presence with unbelievable joy. Heaven's going to be a party scene. It's a place of loud cross songs of joy, of exuberant dancing. You know, we're not going to be Northern Irish anymore when we're in heaven. 
We're not going to see God and give him a formal handshake. We're going to be going nuts. We're going to wrap his arms around us. He's going to wrap his arms around us. We're going to be dancing around with joy, praising the Lord at the top of our former lungs because we won't have these physical lungs anymore. We'll have something better to make all kinds of joyful noise to the Lord. So that's how it is. That's how the presence of the Lord should be sung to, how the presence of the Lord should be praised and its effects in our life. Woo! This makes me want to dance. This makes me, this makes me, I won't do that. It makes me want to sing. I won't do that either. But um, we, we do want to receive the Lord's blessing and we want to bless you. So someone with a much better voice and talent than I is going to come and Ernie is going to close us with the, the blessing. That song of the ironic blessing uh, put to music. So it says it better than I could. So I thank you for listening. I thank you for uh, rejoicing and praising the Lord, lifting him up with me as together we uh, live for him and he lives for us, lifted out of our gloom and dancing with joy. Praise the Lord, my friends. All righty. Amen. Quick set, we're going to be singing uh, the blessing. It's a new song. It's your, it's scripture, put two chords. So. Um, if you're looking for the for the uh, chords, I think the I mean for the lyrics, I think they're in Leviticus. Numbers. Numbers. Is it numbers? numbers chapter six. Yes, 624, numbers, and you'll see the lyrics there. So, here you go.
that you're there for us, Lord. Yes, Lord. You never leave us, Lord, nor you forsake us, Lord. Uh, there may be pain in the night, Lord. That uh, there, there will be really hard times, Lord. But in the morning, Lord, when your mercy renews, um, as you promise in your word, Lord, um, there is rejoicing. There is a reason to sing. There's a reason to dance, Lord. And it's because of your faithfulness, because of the of amount of love you have shown us, Lord, and the love you have shown on the cross and the love that you have shown in your resurrection. Bless my brothers and sisters, Lord, and may your face shine upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Calvary Bay Valley's uh, Wednesday uh, service Bible study. Um, but we'll be um, this Sunday, 11 a.m., as usual. And remember, 10 a.m., study time. If you want to be part of that, be on it. God bless you. <laughs> Bye.